Thanks for making this happen. Um, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to stand before you and uh, introduce Rabbi Kushner, uh, who I met for the first time this evening uh, in person, but uh, I've known for a long time through his writings. Uh, and this is what I learned tonight. Uh, my teacher at the Jewish Theological Seminary, Rabbi Neil Gilman, who teaches theology, who introduced me to Rabbi Kushner's work, was a classmate of Rabbi Kushner. Um, and we made that connection earlier this evening. And something I learned uh, deeply from, uh, from Rabbi Gilman was that there's theology that's for the academy, uh, and there's theology also that's for people outside. Um, and one of the things that, that I see uh, in Rabbi Kushner's writing and works is very thoughtful, very deep, very learned. Something that engages everybody about the important questions, the important lessons that we all need to lead, to lead meaningful lives and to move through the ups and downs of life. Um, it's uh, Rabbi Kushner's book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, that uh, I read first um, and influenced me a tremendous amount. And for, uh, before coming here to Boston, I spent many years at the Chicagoland Jewish High School where I was a teacher of theology. And I brought this book to a whole generation or two, high school generations are shorter, four years, <laughs> of high school students, um, knowing that the lessons uh, within this book that Rabbi Kushner learned through life experience and were important for our young teens to experience as they were beginning life, to be able to have the tools that this book gives to help them move forward. Um, rabbi Kushner is the Rabbi Laureate of Temple Israel in, Na uh, in Natick, right down the street. It's not so far, Newton people, even though it's on the other side of Route 128. I'm not a New Englander, but I know it's not that far. I've driven there. You can go there and back. It's terrific. He's written uh, 13 books over his career, and his newest one is Nine Essential Things I've Learned About Life. Um, I haven't yet read it because it's the new book, but I'm looking forward very much to reading it, and we're going to hear a little bit about it tonight. And it's my pleasure and honor to welcome Robert Kushner. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you all for turning out. I think somewhere along the way, Luba and Lauren have learned the secret of running a successful meeting, and you know what that is? Have only as many chairs there as you expect people to come. <laughs> and that immediately gives you the sense that this meeting is a success, it's crowded, people have gone. You will appreciate, I think, just how meaningful it is for my wife, Suzette, and myself to be here in this location, in this building, at this season of the year. Our son Aaron, for whom the library is named, was an eighth grader at Solomon Schechter, seven months short of graduating when he died. It was just about this time of the year. His yard site is coming up in a couple of weeks. Toward the end of his life, when he was desperately sick, he made sure to get up and get dressed and get to school every day because he knew if he came to this building, he would find people who loved him. And when we walked in this morning, I could not help but remember that these were the hallways that Aaron walked on the next to last day of his life. So thank you for sharing this with us. I want to tell you about my new book, and maybe the place to start is the title, Nine Essential Things I've Learned About Life. People ask me, why nine? Just tell it right. <laughs> I didn't want to do a ten best, not, not another ten best. <laughs> anything beyond that would be too many, anything below that would not, who's going to spend money on a short book like that? <laughs> but what holds the nine ideas together, and I, uh, you know, I'm always wondering, worried that if, you know, if I have a kind of a non-descriptive title like this, people suspect that I'm just sort of, this may be my last book, I just cleaned out my file and dumped everything between covers. No. The theme of the book is during the five years I spent as a rabbinical student at the seminary, the rules changed, and the religion I entered believing 
the religion I was taught about at the Jewish Theological Seminary was not the religion that I had to lead congregants in. That's not what they were prepared to practice. The key was, I grew up in the 1940s and 50s in a theology of command and obey. The role of religion is to tell you what God wants. The role of the rabbi is to make sure you know what God wants. The role of the congregant is to salute and do what God wants. I grew up in that world. I was taught to be that sort of rabbi. Uh, my first rabbinic assignment was as chaplain in the United States Army, where the system of command and obey was not exactly unknown. <laughs> and then after an internship at a very traditional <coughs> congregation on Long Island, I came to Natick. And now I would tell people what to do, and they say, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I would tell them, we expect your children to come to junior congregation as part of Hebrew school. And they'd say, my son's in Little League, and he cares more about that than he does about Hebrew school. I had to learn that my job as a rabbi was not simply to inform, but to transform. I was telling somebody the other day, we were out at the dinner with friends, I left rabbinical school with a six-page printout of which fish are kosher and kosher juice are permitted to eat. <laughs> In 50 years, I have consulted that list three times. <laughs> Two were for our own adventures, and one was a question somebody asked me. So we're living in a very different world. And I had to try and persuade people. I could not assume. I could assume their Jewish loyalty. I could assume their attachment to Judaism. I could not assume their commitment to be obedient to mitzvah-performing Jews. I had to work on that end of it. One of the areas I found most difficult was the number of people, adult members of a congregation, who came to me with questions about God and portrayed themselves, confessed to having a very undeveloped notion of God. I remember particularly, there was a 15-year-old boy came up to me, the, maybe my second, third year in Nadia, and said, Rabbi, I don't believe in God. I got that. This I'm prepared for. <laughs> uh, I learned that the answer to that is not to try and persuade him. The answer is, and I got this from, uh, actually I got this from the old woman, who got it from Harry Emerson Fosdick. The response is, Tell me about this God you don't believe in, because there are a lot of gods I don't believe in either. Maybe we'll find we both reject the same God. Maybe we'll find one we both believe in. So he went on to say, I think God is a fraud. So often in my life, there's something I really wanted, and I prayed for it, and I prayed hard for it, and I reminded God how good I had been, and he didn't get it. Who needs a God like that? It's all made up. I said to him, this God that you're having trouble believing in, this God who doesn't answer your prayers, he doesn't happen to live at the North Pole, does he? <laughs> <laughs> because the way you're talking about it, that sounds a whole lot like Santa Claus. <laughs> you know, Dear Santa, please send me the following. I've been a good boy or girl and I deserve that. And I had to try and find a more mature way of talking to people about God, and it was not easy. I remember once... I was speaking at the 92nd Street Y in New York. We got to a question period. A woman asked me a question, why are so many Nobel Prize winning scientists atheists? I said, probably because so many Nobel Prize winning scientists are Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> and in Judaism, we encourage people to challenge and to ask questions and not to accept on faith. And then I went on to say, but you know, if I could spend 15 minutes with these brilliant scientific atheists, I'd like to ask them some questions. I'd like to ask them, what would your marriage be like if you and your wife related to each other based on what you knew about sex when you were 12 years old? What would your financial situation be like if you handled your money based on what you knew about investing when you were 12 years old? So why is it, when it comes to some of the most important dimensions of life, what matters and what are supreme values and how to choose among difficult alternatives, why is that the only area where you don't feel you have to learn anything beyond what you knew at age 12? 
but this is where we are. Maimonides dealt with this 700 and some odd years ago. He said, we understand God is not a person. He is not an old man who lives in the sky. But our human minds are such that we can only think in terms of a person. And so inevitably we talk about the hand of God, the eyes of God, the will of God. And we have to keep reminding ourselves this is poetry. This is not accurate description. I've tried to teach people the question is not where is God, but when is God? What moments have to be happening for us to experience the reality of God? Let me tell you about the day I learned what it means to be a rabbi. Maybe my third, fourth year in Natick, I call at the office. There had been a sudden death in the congregation. A young man who a husband and father had died rushed out of the house to see if I could do anything to make the life feel better. She, I walk in, she says to me, Rabbi, why would God do this to such a good person? So I start to give her my evolved theology in the image of Mordecai Kaplan about a God who's not omnipotent and not doing a thing for her. <laughs> finally, finally the insight that has animated my rabbinic practice ever since glimmered in my mind. When a widow whose husband has just died says, why would God do this? She is not asking for a theological answer. She doesn't want theology. She wants a hug. Mm -hmm. And so I hugged her. And I sat down. And I held her hand. And when I left, she said to me, Rabbi, thank you. I can't tell you how much this has helped me. It sounds like a theological question. It's not. It's a question issued in pain and confusion. And when I learned the difference, I became a lot more effective. What are the moments when we can feel God is present? That's why we pay shiva calls on friends and neighbors who have suffered a loss. Because what they need at that time is the assurance that they have not been abandoned. Tragedy strikes you, somebody you care about dies, you lose your job, whatever it is. You feel abandoned. And what you need at that point is not a learned answer. What you need is the assurance that you are still cared about. Do you remember a couple of years ago, there was this great scientific psychological experiment on whether prayer helps sick people get better? They assembled this massive cohort of post-operative patients, divided them in three groups. One group was prayed for and they knew it. One group was not, one group was prayed for and they didn't know it. And one group was not prayed for at all. And they wanted to see would it make any difference. What did they find? No difference whatsoever. CNN interviewed me about that experiment when the results came out. And the interviewer said, hey, Rabbi, doesn't that prove that prayer doesn't make any difference? I asked the rabbi that question, what do you think he's going to say? <laughs> I said, no, it doesn't prove a thing. God's role is not to make sick people healthy. That's the doctor's job. God's role is to make sick people strong. God's role is to make sick people brave. And that God, I find, is always there. The young man for whom this library is named, was born with an incurable, extremely rare birth defect. It dominated his whole life, but not, could not dominate his mind or his spirit. And what saved him? What made it possible to come to a school like Solomon Schechter? What made it possible for him to go out in society, though he looked very strange? What made it possible was the knowledge that there were people who loved him. That was how God manifested himself in a 12-year-old child's world. That is how God manifests himself in the lives of people who are afflicted with all sorts of diseases. God's role is not to cure them. If the doctors can cure them, that's wonderful. That's one of the things that God inspires doctors to be. I was born in 1935. When I was growing up, my parents were terrified of all the things that could happen to me, from mumps to measles to polio. But one by one, we found cures for all of those diseases. 
Instead of asking why does God let these things happen, we saw God inspire doctors and researchers to do something about it. But even more importantly, we found God move the victims, the sick people, their families, their parents, inspire them to go on living in a very unfair world. So one of the chapters in my book is about, is it legitimate to be angry at God? Something terrible happens to me, you feel upset, it's not right. Can you be angry at God? I, uh, I confess, this is, uh, I, I try not to tell too many people about this, but I think my secret is safe with you. <laughs> A couple of weeks ago, I checked my book out on Amazon.com <laughs> just to see what people were saying about it. And they, they printed five replies, four of them very flattering. Uh, you know, I don't know if people really read the book, but they said all the right things. <laughs> One critical man wrote that he, like Suzette and myself, had lost a child, and he blames God for it, and he is angry at God. Okay, he and I have a theological difference. How do I understand the difference? He needs somebody to be angry at. A terrible injustice has happened to him and his family, and he needs somebody to be outraged at. And God is the obvious candidate because people sold him when he was a child on the idea that God is all-powerful. A colleague of mine, rabbi in Maryland, sent me a book he'd written about how he was afflicted with cancer and how he went into the hospital and people were so nice and people handled the fact that the rabbi who had comforted them in the hospital, now they were comforting him. And at the end of the book, he says, he doesn't share the theology of some colleagues, and I think I know who he was thinking of, that God does not control everything. He believes that God has a reason why bad things happen to good people, and God has the power to provide happy endings, Okay, it's a big world out there. He wants to believe that. I have no issue with that. It doesn't work for me. And I'll tell you, it does not work for hundreds and hundreds of people who might have counsels, people who sat with me, people who read my book, people who heard my lectures. What do you gain by being angry at God except to cut off the avenue of help, of sustenance that would be so good for you? God could not cure our son. It was an incurable genetic disease. What he did was give our son the immense courage to live with his affliction. What he did was inspire other young boys and girls, his classmates in this building, to reach out with affection. Not to pity him, sometimes even to envy him because he was so bright and so witty. And so on top of things, you have to love him. To cut yourself off from everything that God offers, I think, is a terrible mistake. The legitimacy of being angry at God. For many years, our grandchildren went to Camp Ramah in uh, Georgia, uh, Clayton, Georgia, Ramah de Rome. They were living in Miami when it started, and they went there. A couple of years ago, we, we went there a couple of years for Passover, for a wonderful Passover Institute. It's uh, so much easier for me to give a lecture every day than to cash the house. <laughs> <laughs> One summer, a terrible thing happened. First day of camp, the oldest boy's bunk went on a white water rafting trip, a kayaking trip, as they did every summer. They looked forward to this adventure first day of camp, you all, I trust, are aware of the psychological truth that if you don't give adolescents something dangerous to do, they will find it for themselves. <laughs> uh, I think this is, this is where the, uh, some of the, the uh, kids, the, the rites of passage, that's the phrase I was looking for. The rites of passage in primitive societies in Africa and South America a boy on the brink of adolescence has to go out and do something dangerous. You know, kill a wild animal, live off the land for a, few, a month, what, so a week, whatever he has to do. Young boys have to prove themselves. 
And if you don't give them a way of proving how brave they are, they will find it and they will do something dangerous. The equivalent in American society is high school football, <laughs> and the equivalent in American Jewish society is bar mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, these campers, first day of camp, they go on this whitewater kayaking thing. It's always been exciting. Nothing bad ever happened. One day, as they were ready to dock the kayaks, the boy fell into the water, and another one of the kids the nicest, most loved kid in the bunk gets out to help him, is swept away by the current, lodged under a rock, and he drowns. The camp is traumatized. His bunk is shocked. The director of the camp, with whom I had a relationship for all the Pesach times, we spent there, calls me up and says, any chance you can come down here and try and make these kids feel better? I said, I'll be down on my next plane. I go down. And I meet with the kids, and I'm prepared for them to be very angry at God, and very angry at life, and very angry at the unfairness of it. And all I can do is say, I'm not here to change your minds. What happened to Andrew was totally unfair, totally unjustified, and totally undeserved. I want to tell you what to do with those feelings. And I did something that I had originally heard. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Aviva Zornberg, the Anglo-Israeli Bible scholar should you ever have the opportunity to hear her, she comes to Boston pretty much every year. Go hear her. She's incredible. I hear her once talking about the issue of being angry at God. She asked the audience to open their Chumashim to the first page of Kibari, the book of Deuteronomy, where she says, Moses does something totally out of character. Moses gets angry at God in chapter 1 of Deuteronomy. He says to God, for 40 years I have been your faithful servant. I carried your message to these people. I told them not to do things they wanted to do. And now they're all going to get to live in the promised land, these people who made my life so miserable for 40 years, and I'm going to die here in the desert. It's not fair. And Professor Zornberg says, why is Moses suddenly losing his temper at God? I always assume because he's a cranky old man, that's what you do when you're that old. <laughs> so I'm very brilliant. She said, no. he's doing it to give the Israelites permission to articulate their anger at God. And as soon as, she, as soon as Moses gives them permission to be angry at God the way he was, they take it and they run with it. They say, God hates us. If God loved us, he would have let us stay in Egypt and sent the Egyptians out of this miserable desert. If God loved us, he would have told us to turn right at Sinai and go to Kuwait <laughs> instead of turning left and coming to Canaan. And right after the Israelites have vented all the anger at God that they've been holding inside them for 40 years, we come to the single most beloved verse in the entire Torah. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. What does Orenberg do with that verse? If there are things you're afraid to tell somebody you love, not just God, your husband or wife, your parents, your child, your brother, sister, your best friend, if there are things you're afraid to tell them that they have done something to upset you, you cannot love them with your whole heart. Your love will be less than wholehearted. You have to trust the relationship to survive the honesty of telling them what's on your soul. And Zornberg says, this is what Moses is doing to God. And this is what we should do for God. When we are angry at the unfairness of life, pour it out. Pour your heart out. Pour your anger out for God. He won't zap you for it. He won't put you on his hate list for it. God is on your side. And then after you've poured your anger out, realize that what happened to you was not God's fault. Sometimes it's just nature. Sometimes it's other people's meanness. Sometimes it's bad luck. I mean, why, why should one not terribly attractive person be built with the ability to throw a football in such a way that he earns $10 million a year? <laughs> and people who are trying to do something good for humanity can't pay their fuel bills. Yeah, life is unfair. Face it. 
And instead of being angry at God, instead of giving up on the world, surround yourself with other people who share what you feel. And face down the world. Let me share a couple more chapters out of the book with you, and then I'll stop and take questions. One that is very close to my heart. I call the chapter, Forgiveness is a Favor You Do Yourself. It's a lesson I learned early in my rabbinic career. I gave a sermon on Yom Kippur, articulating what I always thought the message of Yom Kippur was. Before you can ask God to forgive you for your misdeeds, forgive all the people who have offended you. So I gave that sermon. Day after Yom Kippur, a member of the congregation, comes into my office furious with me over that sermon. She tells me the story. Six years ago, her husband walked out of her and the children, ran off with a younger woman he'd been seeing, has never made the alimony payments he promised. He can't, she can't buy the kids the things they want, all their friends have. She looks at me and says, and you want me to forgive him for what he did to us? I said, yeah, I want you to forgive him. Why, you think you're doing any harm by hating him? He's living down in New Jersey with his new wife, and he doesn't care what you think about him. And if he were to know that this moment you are furious, well, they would probably please him. Why are you permitting him to live rent-free in your head when he no longer lives in your house? The only power he has is the power to define you as a rejected woman. And he exercises that power only when you permit him to. Wash that man out of your hair. Don't let him dominate you like that. Don't let him define you. I had the same conversation a couple of years ago. I was speaking at the JCC in San Francisco about this theme. A young woman came up to see me, tells me the story that five years ago, she lost out on a fellowship she thought she was entitled to because the woman who got it was had carrying in on an affair with a professor who awarded it. And she said, you want me to forgive him for what he did? I said, yeah. Why wouldn't you? You can't do him any harm. Too late to get the fellowship. Why are you giving these people power over your mind? Why are you giving them the power to inhabit you with all these bad thoughts that make you dislike yourself, that make you feel weak and impotent? She says, you mean they won? I said, no, they lost. You won. You won because you kept your integrity. And that is something there is no prize to have for. And they lost because they compromised their integrity. What did they get for it? He got a couple of hours of pleasure in bed, and she got a fellowship which expired three years ago, and now they're left with it. You have your integrity. You have your sense of being the right person. You need that. That is your armor in an unfair world. My chapter on forgiveness begins with the observation, revenge is everybody's favorite sin. And by the way, you know it is a sin. It's explicit in the Torah. Explicit. The same verse that tells you to love your neighbor as yourself tells you don't carry a grudge. Because first of all, you're not doing the other person any harm. And secondly, you're making yourself feel impotent, feel powerless, feel victimized. Why would you choose to prolong that? Nobody is victimizing you today except yourself because you are holding on to that memory. Let go of it already. And one chapter, I'm, uh, I'm leaving Sunday. I'm flying to Minneapolis on the beginning of the book tour. I'm invited to speak at the Roman Catholic Basilica. In uh, Minneapolis, it's a magnificent building. They've been doing some wonderful stuff here. I think I will leave this chapter out of my talk. I think I can prove textually that for 2,000 years, we have misunderstood the story of the Garden of Eden. I don't think it's about original sin, and I don't think it's about the fall of man. Read it. What happened was, what messed us up is, the Torah is a couple of thousand years old, more than that. When, in the second century of the Common Era, Palestine, Israel, was under the part of the Roman Empire in the Hellenistic period, and to implement them, what happened was, 
under the influence of Greek thought. The original story, I am convinced, it's all in my book, I'll just summarize it. The original story did not have Eve created out of man's rib. The original story, I am 100% confident, this is what it says in the Torah. God created a kind of a conjoined twins, a double person, one half male, one half female. God couldn't find any mate for this hybrid creature. He caused it to fall asleep, cut it in half, not rib. The word tzela in the Torah means side. Cut it in half, healed the breach, and then set them out there so that when God, when Adam finds Eve, what does he say to her? You are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And they, you know, the, God, the, what does God say there? Therefore, when a man cleaves unto his wife, they become one. They rediscover the wholeness they had before the beginning. Do you realize human beings are the only creatures we know of who, when they mate, do it face to face? No other animal does that. Think of your dog's coupling, right? Think of all the animals that you see on, on the educational TV. Only human beings couple face to face because only for human beings does it matter whom you are having the sexual relationship with. It doesn't matter to your pets and it doesn't matter to your goldfish and it doesn't matter to the birds. Only for people. What is the point of the story? Eve was the first human being, the first one brave enough to step across the line that separates human beings from animals and to acquire the knowledge of good and bad. Remember? Because this is what the Garden of the Fall of Man story forgets. Remember the name of the fruit? It's not the fruit you're not supposed to eat. It's the fruit of the knowledge of good and bad. To be a human being is to know that some things are wrong and some things are right and necessary. No other creature can understand that statement. This is what the story is about. The challenge of being human. The challenge of being capable of being judged. That's why they, what, what happens right after they eat the fruit, they leave the garden, they realize they're naked. Right? You read the story, you say, well, of course they realize they're naked and they're embarrassed. I'd be, wouldn't I be embarrassed if I was out in the world naked? They're the only people in the world, remember? There are no other people in the world. Right. They are embarrassed because they are now subject to moral scrutiny. Now they have a sense of doing something. Animals can be disobedient. Animals can be inconvenient. They can be messy. They can't be bad because only a human being can understand concepts of good and bad. Okay, this is a little bit of what I learned as a rabbi. Rabbinical school prepared me to be a rabbi for an entirely different kind of Jewish population. Uh, I love my teachers. I venerate my teachers. They didn't prepare me to be a rabbi in Native. I had to learn that through my mistakes, and uh, I'm very grateful to my congregants in Native who tolerated my mistakes as I made them in the early years. I think by now I've gotten most of them right. <laughs> uh, I want to leave you with one last word. I don't know, this may be the last book I will ever write. I give birth to a book about once every three years. I'm 80 years old. I, it's getting harder all the time. I don't know if I'll be writing this book. I want to share with you the last page of this new book because it's a very personal statement. And if this is the last page of the last book I ever wrote, I will feel very good about that. I call it a love letter to a world that may or may not deserve it. Dear world, we've been through a lot together over the past eight decades, you and I. Marriages, births, <coughs> deaths, fulfillment and disappointment, war and peace, good times and hard times. There were days when you were more generous to me than I could possibly have deserved. And there were days, I read this as we gather in the Aaron Kushner Library, there were days when you cheated me out of things that I felt I was entitled to. There were days when you looked so achingly beautiful that I could hardly believe you were mine. 
and days when you broke my heart and reduced me to tears. But with it all, I choose to love you. I love you whether you deserve it or not, and how does one measure that? I love you in part because you're the only world I have. I love you because I like who I am better when I do that. But mostly, I love you because loving you makes it easier for me to be grateful for today and hopeful about tomorrow. Love does that. Faithfully yours, Harold Kushner.